Hi, Parkway Manor. Welcome to Thursday, May 7th. Some more of the chocolate touch. John is still in school, not having such a great day. He just finished with lunch. And sadly, everything that he was hoping for was turning to chocolate. He's not exactly enjoying himself. Chapter 8. English class passed without incident. Miss Plimsoll distributed word lists for her pupils to take home. The more words you know, she explained, as always, the more exactly you can think. There were some difficult new words that John noticed. Indigestion, acidity, unhealthiness, moderation, digestibility. As Miss Plimsoll explained the meaning of each one, it seemed to John as though they all had a special bearing on his present uncomfortable condition. At last, the bell rang. Very well, class, Miss Plimsoll said. Time for outside activities. Have a good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Plimsoll. Miss Plimsoll gave the signal for dismissal, and the pupils in the front row filed out, followed by those in the second row, including John and Susan. Susan played a violin in the school orchestra, and usually she and John went to the rehearsals in the auditorium together. This time, Susan hurried ahead of him and John followed very slowly. The members of the orchestra were sitting at their music stands on the auditorium stage when John, carrying his dark blue trumpet case, got to his chair in the brass section. Mrs. Quaver had already begun to explain a difficult passage to the girl who played the flute. Now, just after Jay sings, nestlings chirp and flee, she was saying, you come in with your trill. Do -do 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 -do. Do you see the place on your skirt? Good. Ah, John, Mrs. Quaver exclaimed. I'm glad you're not absent. As I've just told the others this afternoon, we're having the first joint rehearsal of my arrangement of A Boy's Song by James Hogg. We've been over all the individual parts and all the sections, as you will recall. Now it's time to fit the pieces together. John nervously opened up his trumpet case, took out his shining gold trumpet, from its bed of scarlet velvet. The beautiful new instrument gave him confidence. He worked the valves nimbly with his fingers and looked up at Mrs. Quaver again. Now, John, she said, tell me when your little solo begins. Right after the end of the second verse, Mrs. Quaver, John promptly replied. He had practiced his part every evening in the basement at home for the last two weeks. He knew every note perfectly. After the line, that's the way for Billy and me. Good, Mrs. Quaver said. And don't forget what I told you, John. This is a happy song. I want you to play ta-da, 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 simply repeating the rhythm of the voice. And I want you to be light and lively. This is supposed to be the song of a boy who loves romping around in the country. Ta-da, 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 thought John. Guess that shouldn't be too difficult even with the whole orchestra listening to him. He had played it over and over and over again at home. But he would have to try extra hard here. This was going to be his first solo. Everyone else was depending on him to play properly. Right, said Mrs. Quaver brightly. With her baton, she rapped twice sharply on the music stand before her. All the musicians brought their instruments into playing position. Susan poised her bow over the strings of the violin. John held his trumpet close to his mouth and wiggled his fingers on the valves. Mrs. Quaver's baton moved from side to side, up and then down. The cymbals clashed and the drums thumped. The pianist brought his flat fingers down on the ivory keys of the piano. The violinists and the cellists made their weeing and wimping sounds. All were in perfect unison. The rehearsal had begun. After the last line of the first verse, John's fellow trumpeter echoed the rhythm of the singer's voice. Mrs. Whit Quaver smiled approvingly at the successful performance. The song continued. John swallowed with an effort and put the mouthpiece of his trumpet to his lips for his big solo. The mouthpiece instantly changed to, you guessed it, chocolate. Then almost as fast the chocolate spread along the instrument, 
changing all the flashing gold into a dull brown. The first name, the first note came out fairly true. But chocolate trumpets cannot withstand much pressure. The hole in the mouthpiece softened and got clogged up, and the valves stuck as John desperately tried to finish his part. Mrs. Quaver's eyes almost popped out of her head as she listened to him play. Ta-ta! Ta-too-ta! ta ta It sounded as though John were trying to play a soap-filled bubble pipe. Terribly flustered, he put down his trumpet. Mrs. Quaver was speechless. The orchestra was rocked by uproarious laughter. The other trumpeter leaned over towards John's chair and picked up his trumpet. And he shouted, It's a chocolate trumpet! No wonder it sounded like that. John Midas was trying to play a chocolate trumpet. Well, John didn't wait to hear anymore. He fled from the stage and out to the playground. Without stopping even to look around, he ran through the stone gateway and homeward. We'll do one more chapter. Chapter 9. Oh, the shame of it, the humiliation. John wept breathlessly as he ran, shocked and frightened, indignant and angry at the world that had suddenly turned against him. Mean old things, John thought, blaming Miss Plimsoll and Mrs. Quaver for his failures, even though nothing that had happened to him had been any of their faults. Horrible old school, he thought, even though he had liked school until that morning. Hateful Susan, he thought, even though he knew at the same time he was really longing to be friends again with her. Through the window, Mrs. Midas saw John coming up the pathway. Hello, John, dear, she called from the living room. You're home early today. How nice. As a reward, there will be chocolate after supper. I hate it, John shouted. Now, at that point, he was crying too hard to say anything else at that moment. When she heard the sound of his voice, Mrs. Midas went rushing into the hallway. What, what's the matter, dear, she asked, putting her arm around him. John twisted away from her grasp and ran past her, started up the stairs toward his bedroom. Susan doesn't want me at her birthday party. I know she doesn't. Well, I don't want to go to her old rotten party anyway. I don't think you really mean that, Mrs. Midas said. Besides, she added. Mrs. Buttercup just telephoned to say she was going to drive over herself at four o'clock to pick you up for the party. She did, John said, blinking down at his mother from the top of the stairway. Yes, she did, Mrs. Midas assured him. So you'd better hurry and get yourself washed and brushed. Your party clothes are laid out on your bed. There were games on the Buttercup's lawn while it was still warm enough outside. Later, the party supper, including birthday cake, was going to be served indoors, and there would be a magician and a short movie. John joined in the blind man's bluff and grandmother's footsteps and fox and geese, and soon he began to feel more cheerful. He even temporarily forgot about his chocolate problem. Susan looked very pretty. Her yellow curls had been brushed so hard that they looked silkier than ever. She was wearing a big blue ribbon the same color as her eyes. Her cheeks were flushed with excitement, a deeper pink than her new party dress. On her feet were dainty little white socks and white shoes with straps that buttoned. Between games, Susan smiled at John and said, I'm glad you came, John. They seemed to be on good terms again. Then Mr. Buttercup approached, bringing a bucket of water from the garage. He set it down in the middle of the lawn without spilling a single drop. Okay, we're going to duck for apples, everyone. Boys against the girls. John, you can be captain of the boys' team. The two teams lined up for the race. Susan, who was leading the girls, and of course, John, leading the boys. Now, the idea is this, Mr. Buttercup explained. When I say go, now not yet, John. Susan and John will run to the bucket. There are 12 apples floating in the bucket and 12 people in the race. Now, using only your teeth, you will grab the apples and run back to your lines. As soon as the first people touch the hands of the number two runners, Denny and Duncan in this case, Susan and John, you're going to go to the end of the lines. 
Denny and Duncan, you're going to run to the bucket and duck for apples. Now, do you understand the way this game's going to work? All right, everyone. One, to get ready. Two, to get steady. And three, two, go! Susan bounded ahead like a jackrabbit and had her face deep in the bucket by the time John reached her side and crouched down for his apple. He got his eye on a big red one with its stalk jutting up conveniently for him to grab. We lowered his face, opened his mouth, and lunged at that apple. Somehow his nose reached the apple before his teeth did, and he, it pushed below the surface of the water. John's mouth followed the apple down. Then a terrible thing happened. The clear water in the bucket turned into dark brown, sweet, liquid chocolate. Susan and John immediately pulled their heads up, but it was too late. Their faces were drenched with chocolate syrup. Oh, Susan exclaimed, wiping chocolate out of her eyes. Chocolate syrup dripped down all over her beautiful pink dress. Oh, she moaned. Now John was in the same state. There was chocolate all over his face. There was chocolate on his white shirt, on his gray shorts, and there was chocolate in his mouth. Oh, glug, John said, glug. Now Susan was too surprised and too angry to speak. For the second time that day, she turned her back on John and ran away from him. Mrs. Buttercup offered to clean John up, but he couldn't bear to stay at the party one more minute. He stared, or he started off at once to go home. And that is the end of our chapter, boys and girls. Tune in tomorrow for chapter 10. Have a fantastic day. I'll see everyone real soon. Bye-bye.